Kia ora koutou. Welcome to our operations and monitoring meeting. And I have asked uh, Councillor O'Keefe to begin with a karakia. Lord, give us your knowledge and your calmness and your strength as we deliberate around and in this building before the council table. We ask this in the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. And we have one previously granted leave of absence to um, Councillor Ollie. We have apologies from Councillor Harvey and Councillor Sears. And Councillor Barber is joining us by Zoom. And just a reminder that um, councillors are accessing their agendas on their iPads um, and um, asking councillors to ensure that their iPads don't block their microphones when they're speaking. Now, um, a reminder about conflicts of interest, which uh, you would need to declare and deal with in the usual way. And uh, first item, item four, which is confirmation of minutes of the previous meeting. Notification, Madam Chair. Yes. Um, I apologies, but I have to be away by quarter past three. They have an un, uh, unexpected event that's popped up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I have a... Yeah, I, I, I've previously notified that. Yeah. Um, and could I have a mover and seconder for the adoption of the minutes from the previous meeting? Thank you, Councillor Watkins. Thank you, um, Councillor Dixon. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. And now moving on to item five, our health and safety report, which will be presented by Manager Bronwyn Bayliss. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Jenny is unwell, not COVID so far, but we'll see. Um, so I'm here in her place. Hopefully I can do things justice. Look, firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the delay in providing this data. Um, it, you know, is through till December last year. Largely that's been due to the disruptions of COVID and the health and safety staff focusing more on managing the organisation's response to COVID and continuing delivery to, to our community through managing that response than uh, focusing on reporting. So it is a little delayed and certainly in it you can see the impacts of the COVID disruption with some of those trend lines. It almost isn't worth looking at from a trend perspective because of that. The uh, comment I would make, though, is that the leading indicators are where we'd expect them to be, given that COVID environment. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. I might not be able to answer them. I do have um, Ms Bass here, who might be able to assist. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Shollum. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, thank you for letting us know that you may or may not be able to answer the questions. I'm, I'm particularly noting that there was an upturn in... Uh, mental health referrals um, uh, due to anxiety or stress from COVID-19. Um, just based on the reporting period being so long ago, I'm just interested to understand, whilst there's not an official report since then until now, how are things tracking now? Mm. We are still seeing uh, a number of referrals coming through. Uh, there's been quite a lot for people to manage over this period of time across this work and home, often it's, it's the home or non-work um, impacts. We also have moved to a new provider who I, um, I think that has probably assisted with an increase in the number of referrals. Um, they've been quite proactive in um, promoting the services, so possibly that accounts for some of the usage as well. Can I ask a follow-up? Just interested to know as well, because it's not something I can get from the report as it currently stands. How are our frontline staff handling things at the moment? I know that stress and anxiety is not something that's unique just to council, it's in our community, and sometimes that's um, inadvertently reflected in negative uh, interactions with staff, and I'm just keen to understand how they're doing. 
Mm, um, Ms Dinwoody may wish to comment as well, but I certainly think things have been more difficult in general than the norm. Thank you. Anything else you'd like to add, Ms Dinwoody? No, okay, thank you. Councillor Kerr. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as was reported, there was a fire on the roof of the Flaxmere pool. Um, without getting into the details of it, I'm really interested in how that's going to be reported back through us as to um, the causes and, most importantly, the learnings. So, the process rather than the event, please. Yes. So, as I understand it, we're still undertaking that investigation um, and... I think probably we would normally think about reporting back through um, risk and assurance, but I'm open to doing it differently in terms of the learnings. Um, okay. Yeah, that, that would be that would be the right, the appropriate um, way to do that. And, I, and we also have, um, I guess, at an executive level, our own version of risk and assurance. Um, which we will be reporting back the findings um, through that first and then on to risk and assurance. Thank you. Any further questions? Well, there being none, could I have a mover and seconder for the recommendation, which is to be found on page eight of the agenda? Thank you, Councillor Shollum. Thank you, Councillor Lawson. I'll put that recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. Carried. Now, moving on to, thank you, Mrs. Bayliss. Uh, moving on to item six, which is the financial quarterly report. And I'll ask Aaron to come forward and present that to us, please. Uh, good, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, quarter three financial result. Um, this quarter, um, like the previous quarters um, of the financial year, have been really affected by the continuing issues that we've seen, and um, you know, with the inflation, the COVID impacts. Um, supply chain, logistics, and that, that's happening both at a, a local um, level, of course, and a global, and a global um, uh, scale as well. Uh, just moving to the forecast, which we see up there, I have uh, two confessions to make. <laughs> um, and a number of you will have picked the errors up in the tables, and um, Alwyn has already done so. <laughs> And so, yeah, um, around the fact that we had some late changes, and when I dragged those through, um, they didn't come through <laughs> into the report. It's very hard to get good stuff these days. Um, <laughs> so I, I do apologise unequivocally for that. Um, and usually I, what I do is I go through and add manually with a calculator to make sure we've got that right. That's how paranoid I am. But uh, this month I uh, missed that one. Um, on the way through, so I do apologise. The slides are the correct numbers, so uh, be assured that when I found that to my horror, I thought, right, well, we need to fix this for a start. Um, so um, just on that, the, the what this stripped-down forecast at a high level really shows is that um, it's showing a, an 875k favourable um, surplus in terms of the general rate and 778k uh, surplus for the targeted rate. Remembering the targeted rate is uh, ring-fenced activities and can't be used for other activities. Uh, in terms of that, then we have uh, what I've put under there for context is the 821k uh, um, number, which is rate-funded uh, projects that were budgeted for that have not been completed. Now, uh, there will be carry-forwards applied for to take those and complete them in the 22-23 year. What that then means is that should they all be approved by council to be carried forward, then you'll be left with a 53-54k surplus, uh, forecasted surplus number in reality at the end of the year. 
Now, that is, as you've heard me probably ad nauseum for the last two or three years, say is like landing a plane on a handkerchief. Um, when you're looking at $94, $95 million worth of um, rate requirement, that is absolutely nothing. Um, and it doesn't take very much to push that uh, either way. Get the next slide. Uh, if I could just, just to round that out, um, Madam Chair. So, um, Aaron's absolutely right. You know, this this, um, this year end result is, is coming to the wire around it being delivered um, on budget or within budget, acknowledging that there are some rates funded carry forwards that will be requested. So, and there is a lot to, you know, whilst we're only two months to the end of the um, financial year, there's, there, from when these forecasts were undertaken, there is still a lot, a lot of water to go under the bridge and a lot can change. So, um, whilst what we're really just forecasting amongst all of that, rather than those precise numbers, is uh, is that if there is a surplus, it'll be very slim. In a red I think there was probably more. Yeah. <laughs> In terms of the accounting result, um, we've got a $7.1 million um, uh, deficit to budget um, year to date. Um, and again, that really, th this um, P&L effectively is showing your profit and loss uh, with the revenue and um, the expenditure side as well, even though that's favourable, is really showing the impact of the headwinds that um, Council uh, have, have been facing. Um, and we'll just go into that in that next slide, if we can, on the revenue. So the revenue, um, you know, being down by, what was it, $13.6 million, um, has been absolutely hammered in a couple of ways. The first, of course, is the fees and charges, which were $4 million um, down. Uh, impacting in there is your, uh, the Splash Planet, um, it's around $2.1 million down in revenue. Uh, in ad addition to that, you had the $9.3 million worth of subsidies and grants. Um, the the uh, sub and and with the fees and charges there is offset in terms of the expenditure but you just see of course the revenue on the slide. Um, the other thing to remember there is that a lot of the uh, Waka Kotahi and Flaxmere development, um, while that's behind in the revenue, it's really timing around budget. When the spend actually occurs, that's when we'll receive the um, subsidy. So of course the the uh, the offset is in the actual um, subsidised spend that hasn't occurred yet. We could go to the next slide. In terms of expenditure, well, this is um, favourable by 6.5 million. Um, this also really is an indicator of, of the issues that council have faced. Um, when you look at, um, you know, you've got uh, personnel that is $2.5 million uh, favourable, and, you know, you look at the resourcing constraint issues that we have um, facing uh, 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 council, um, you've also got lower budgeted spends of quite significant numbers and other costs of um, contracted services, expert advice. They're in two or three million dollars overall. Again, in a normal year, you would have that spend, and you can see the effect when you look at the capital under, um, you know, the program and where it's sitting um, currently. Um, and of course, the finance costs are the other one there, which are around the 1.4 million dollar mark. Um, again when you're spending your full capital spend, your demand um, on, on cash flow is, is being sucked dry and all of a sudden all that budget starts being used up. Um, and, and so you can say it's the revenue that's being affected, but actually it's also the spend, because in this case, the spend isn't a great thing either. Uh, underspend isn't, isn't necessarily a great thing either. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Now, capital, whole of capital spend. Um, you know, $56 million uh, is, the, is the total amount year to date for March. Um, in terms of that, um, we've have got a forecast up there in terms of capital spend of around $94 million. Capital projects are moving just about every day. The, the, you know, the, the, the complexity around when something will be finished, when it will be started, there's a whole lot of factors around that. So that's the one part of the forecast that's very difficult and can move an awful lot in a very short amount of time um, with conditions shifting all the time. There's a lot of unknowns in there. So that's just one thing to bear in mind um, with that forecast that you see up there. Now, the other thing um, which uh, you may have already seen probably in your calendars, I would think, is that there is a capital workshop uh, with council that's going through on the 26th, I think it is, um, towards the end of this month. And uh, that will go into detail on exactly the strategy for that, 
what 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 will be moved forward, which projects will 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 be pushed, and when, and and how we would deal with uh, that hundred million dollar um, that that carry forward that's sitting there at the moment of uncompleted projects. Um, you have to factor in the eighty two million dollars in the twenty two twenty three year, and the amount that's in the following year. How do we do that flexibly? How do we do that quickly and nimbly so that if something becomes uh, you know, of importance that we can pull that forward without too much bureaucracy. Um, so that sort of thing um, all factors into that workshop along with um, the realities of delivering and uh, water reform and so forth. So um, I think that's where um, that a lot of those questions um, can be answered. Um, and I think that's the end of my, any questions? Questions? Councillor Kerr. Um, thank you very much for that thorough update. Um, I'm just referring to the part of the report that talks about the Reserve Bank increasing the official cash rate, and I'm wondering if you can explain to me um, the decision-making around whether we fix or we don't fix and whether we have swaps or we don't have swaps. <coughs> yes, please. So um, that comes back to being driven around the uh, Treasury policy, and the Treasury policy has def definite parameters around how much we need to fix for, uh, in, in terms of uh, how much our debt is to protect us against rising uh, the average cost of funds rising and then um, and exposing us to the, the top end of, of unnecessarily. So we meet uh, once a month, Bruce and I, Mr Allen and I, with um, Bancorp, uh, who are our merchant banker advisors, and we discuss the strategy uh, over the long term. Um, for the last three to four years, we haven't fixed too much because we had a lot of fixing and we had a 15-year view. That 15-year view, however, was quite expensive on the upside because we were taking uh, swaps back in 2009 that are coming due now, probably at rates far higher than where the adjustment came down to. Um, so what we did was we stopped the cover because the interest rates were driving down, dropping down, and we rode that elevator, what we call the elevator, right down, and saved a pile of money in refixing too high, knowing that it was continuing to go down. So it was a not a risk; it was a it was a call, and uh, we've got down to the bottom of that. We uh, last year fixed some money uh, when we borrow it again rather than take swaps out because we've got a water reform issue that we need to take care of. So what we now are doing is we have fixed chunks of money to give us the same cover for that debt. Um, and some of that we fixed at 1.93 last year for till 27 to 29, 2029. So it was a really good deal uh, when you're looking at it now. <laughs> um, so we look at that. We just had a meeting with uh, Bancorp yesterday and uh, while well, they're saying all the forecasts are, are, are very high, they don't believe it will go as high, and already the swap rates going out seven to ten years are falling off because they realise that the market can't stand too much uh, going forward. And just to confirm, all of that reporting goes back through... Through order and risk. Thank you. And just, if I can just, Madam Chair, just one, one other point. I think the, the key thing that we're trying to focus on um, with our policy parameters is actually just trying to stay within the midpoint Yes. Um, and I know um, the chair of our risk and insurance committee is very strong on that. It's ensuring that you know, we're not playing uh, the, the hedging game. We're actually, we're actually trying to make sure that we're just sitting as, as evenly and close to the midpoint of our policy settings as, as, as we can. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Nixon. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, I did get a little confused over the rating figures, and I thought it was me. <laughs> Um, well spotted. So I just put it down to I was done. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a lot of change occurring you know, externally and affecting us quite significantly, both on the revenue and expenditure side. And looking ahead and reading all the stuff that's coming out from official, unofficial circles, yeah, there's a lot of pressures coming, a lot of changes, a lot of inaccuracies. When I say inaccuracies, I mean things are different from how we anticipated. And I look at things like the, the supply chain disruption coming out of China, which just doesn't look as though it's going to get any better, to be honest. Uh, I look at the, um, uh, the war in the Ukraine, which is uh, likewise you know, seeming almost certainly going to have a big effect. 
and a big effect on Europe. And when I put all these things in, I think, yeah, because we're, we're really at the point of um, uh, moving towards finalising our next year's uh, budget, uh, annual plan, uh, is that going to be so far out that it almost needs to be rewritten? How do we deal with something that, you know, we're sort of going in different directions, and I just wonder how this is going to work out in the end? Uh, through you, Chair, and thanks, uh, Councillor Nixon. I think that um, has been flagged in the next agenda <coughs> item when we um, look at you know performance and monitoring report. Clearly, clearly, there are things associated with some of the issues that you've raised, supply chains, um, labour shortages, uh, a whole range of factors that um, are driving cost price uh, inflation. And, you know, that's affecting businesses, it's affecting households, and it will um, affect council. Um, because, yes, you're right, to a degree, uh, the budgets that we set uh, a year ago or through uh, the 2021 LTP, um, versus the world that we're living in today. Um, but those are the things that um, you know, have been well signposted in our job as an executive working with you as governors is for you to make some of those um, choices. So next week, um, you'll be sitting down uh, with officers looking at a three-year capital work program. Mm. Clearly, um, we are not going to be able to deliver everything that was in the original capital works program because in a number of areas, we're seeing 10% plus price mm. Um, inflation, but that will be the set of choices that you get to make um, as governors about your um, priorities. And clearly, we're going to have to stay live to um, some of these issues that will fly. Very difficult, as I think you've made the point a number of times, to actually predict uh, the, the future. And um, we have to evolve to what's happening in front of us. But clearly, there are some cost pressures um, you know, that, that are impacting everywhere, whether it's for households or business or council operations that we're going to have to work through. But we are working on a fairly clear direction that's been set by this council um, that um, as far as next year's annual plan goes, um, you know, it will be within a rating impact that you agreed when you set the long-term plan. No, nothing, nothing more. Um, so we will, you know, we will work together in terms of making choices within that um, context. Can I just make a couple of comments? Um, the, the, the first one is, you know, the... There seems to be a trend towards a slowing economy, I suppose that's the best way to put it. Um, and just picking up on your point on um, interest rates uh, and some expectation they might not be as ferocious as has uh, been originally assumed, which to me is accurate because if, if interest rates go up and the economy slows down, then the need for further interest rate increases uh, diminishes. Is that the sort of advice you were intimating to? You didn't really say that much about it, but it's quite a significant cost in our overall it is you know, budget. Yes, it is a significant cost. Um, just to give you an idea, every time the retail market in terms of mortgages goes up 2%, it sucks out between 12 and $15 billion out of the New Zealand economy. So, um, well, it's going to go up. Sure, it's going to go yeah, up. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the latest uh, meeting that we had with Bancorp was saying that the, the swap rates are now fallen from above 4% yeah. as, as a future indicator OCR to below, to just now um, 39 even right across the 10-year range. So that's why they're saying the curve is starting to invert the other way because the market's starting to go, mm, maybe um, it's not going to be quite... It will be aggressive, but not quite as long and aggressive sustained. Yeah. That's and pretty if, much what I was hoping you'd tell me. <laughs> I'll just make one, one comment through you, Chair, around the more macro um, you know, <coughs> observations that you're making. What, what I'd say at the moment is that um, everything's pointing to some of the fundamentals around Hastings, notwithstanding uncertainties and headwinds, remaining strong. Um, the population is growing. You know, the, the population right. in Hastings between 2018 and 2021 went from 86,000 to nearly 91,000. You know, huge increase in population. Those those trends are continuing. We're seeing um, no shortage. You know, things that you could almost say are counterintuitive. But what are we seeing? We're seeing resource consents lodged for big new um, land developments. Um, global demand for largely what we produce here is staying high. Commodity prices are still high. Um, you know, if we look at the things that um, big corporates are doing that, that take a you know that take a multi-year view and have big balance sheets, they're still making big investments um, in, in Hastings. So what's there's yeah all of this uncertainty at a macro level. I think 
um, you know, it's also important to stay live to that some of the fundamentals um, that are driving and have been driving activity are still underlying pretty, um, pretty sound. Oh, Thank you. No further questions? Thank you. And a seconder, please. Thank you, Councillor Redstone. I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. Carried. Thank you, Aaron. Now, moving on to item 7, which is our performance and monitoring report. And um, Mr Allen is going to speak to that. Oh, no, I was going to make uh, through you, Chair. I was going to make some comments, but I'll cover them. Cover them off. I'll take my report as read. But it is just acknowledging, um, you know, that context that we are operating in in terms of pretty some pretty significant construction price inflation starting to, um, you know, starting to come through. Um, but that's been well signposted. And um, next week we will get into, um, you know, we will get into the substantive conversations around starting to look at what a three-year capital work programme um, looks like, both in terms of you know, capacity in the market, what the real costs are that we're now um, dealing with. Um, but that's what's in, what's in front of us. But with those comments, I'll hand over to Mr Allen. Thank you, Chief. Um, through you, Madam Chair. So we'll do what we've previously done uh, in presenting the performance and monitoring report, which, you're, um, which will ultimately take us read. Um, as per usual, there is a lot of information presented in that report uh, with covering the, the wide gambit of what uh, Council does in a, over a quarter. Uh, but just as the Chief alluded to, so, you know, covered off in the executive overview, um, you know, we do have that recurring theme of a number of issues that are impacting on us as an organisation and on our community as we work our way through the delivery of, uh, of our plan. Um, and But that is supported by, um, as, as the Chief noted, you know, a growing economy, um, and I think something we also need to acknowledge, you know, a dedicated staff to actually trying to do the best in, in the situation um, that we have. So what we'll do, we'll just work through the eight strategic priority areas um, that we have uh, in the long-term plan. And I'll have a slide for each. Um, between myself, Mr Cameron, Mr Thurman, and Mr Dinwoody, uh, we'll cover off those respective areas um, as we move through. And um, Madam Chair, if we could probably just pause on each um, strategic, strategic priority area and we'll have questions if there are any. Uh, thank you, Mr Allen. Madam Chair, I think the Chief Executive in terms of economic powerhouse has covered things uh, well. Um, fundamentally, we're a growing economy driven by uh, population in particular. I think um, I'm only a level two economist and a level two accountant, but breaking it down to a level two speak. Fundamentally, what we've got is we've got huge demand or a lot of cash driving a limited supply. So if you're after labour um, or if you're trying to tend to someone to do some work for you, the um, supply side of the equation is, is less than the payment side, so that's driving your prices up. And the inflation is, is giving us the... Uh, so fundamentally, we have an economy that's... I guess is booming in, in a lot of sectors and you've got constraints starting to come in in terms of the ability to do the work which is driving the prices up, simple supply and demand. That's giving us inflation which is weakening our purchasing power by sort of 7% over the last years which is making us struggle to meet budgets. Uh, wages and so forth are going up so the government's trying to cool the whole system down by lifting interest rates and they'll try and, yeah, they'll try and strike that sweet spot between not I guess, killing the, the golden goose, but um, getting things back into a sensible sort of equilibrium again. So, And you'll see all those indicators here. We've got growing GDP. Um, uh, house prices are up sort of 30% in the December quarter last year over the previous December quarter and so forth. So um, is there any questions from my level two understanding of economics? <laughs> Councillor Corbyn. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. I'm interested in the increasing interest in the residential intensification design guide. How is that manifesting itself? Is it through requests for the guide or is it um, reference to the guide accompanying um, applications to Council for resource consent? 
through UTIs and all of those things, and pleasingly with um, the number of the resource consents that we're seeing coming in for um, comprehensive um, urban development and stuff, clearly using um, the um, you know the the, the design the des design guide. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Allen. Hello. Mr. Cameron. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. That's you, Mr. Thurlow. Kia ora, councillors. Um, the report covers off a reasonable amount of what's kept the team busy from a transportation, uh, both with getting around and rural living. Um, it's, I'm pleased to report that we are substantively materially out of Warwick Road um, with small minor defects to work through and State Highway 50 with just the planting um, that we're working through and some discussions with Waka Kotahi around timing of remarks. Um, but it's nice to see the substantive back of those projects um, and we'll be working through a bit of a um, debrief lesson learns across the multiple parties on those just to see if we can um, better understand um, some learnings. Um, but obviously some um, exciting um, closures to projects, obviously the Tauru Boardwalk, um, some of you um, will have an invite to that. We just do need to manage um, how many people can go to it because it's not exactly a place where you can easily park at one end and, it, and to do it safely. Um, still working with Waka Kotahi, um, working through their funding, we finally received approval to get on with the business case work for some of the transportation planning, which is critical for the next LTP and Regional Land Transport Program. Um, and the team continue to work through um, various projects, probably the critical one which is included in the major projects report um, that a high level of surveillance will stay over, obviously, is the Napier Road roundabout. Obviously, a substantive intersection piece of work um, and a community that's not shy and coming forward quite quickly. Um, we're also getting close. We would have sealed over the weekend the Amahu, um, the third Amahu roundabout. Unfortunately, there was a bitumen supply issue, so that contractor was just working with its subby just to reschedule that servicing work. Um, but that work of downers on that one has gone ex um, ex expediently um, and a much more preferred speed of delivery. Happy to take questions from a transport perspective. Oh, sorry, and the other one just in the report is um, the Ruahapia um, Otini Road road stopping trial is underway. Um, I'm not going to jinx it. At this stage, it seems to be going okay. Um, and the household um, door knocking and approvals in Fokka 2 has gone extremely positively. So hope to get some movement on that shortly. Thank you, Councillor Nixon. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, I notice not on your list is the uh, well underway middle road shared cycleway. Um, just wondered if there's a reason for that. The, the real question I've got is the last item, Waka Kotahi, um, funding to expand innovating street. I presume this is uh, cycleways and shared pathways and all the rest of it. And I'm just I rode up Napier Road yet again uh, over the weekend. Didn't see anybody else. I don't think I've ever seen anybody else on it. And I just wonder, what's our process for evaluating how successful these various initiatives are to make sure that we build things that are actually wanted and will be used to get best value out of the money that we're spending? Through you, Madam Chair, two parts of that question. Um, innovating street isn't just cycleways, it's actually around turning the streetscape into a, a public open space. Um, and the key part of that is it means Waka Kotahi is paying a much more significant share of the project rather than the standard 50-50 um, funding. And there's a number of workshops going through. Um, in terms of post-project post review, um, and in particular um, on the cycleways one, um, the expectation on how that would work through is via the Active Transport Group, is to reflect on what has been achieved, what is working, and then we self-learn and adjust the programming and timing. So obviously that was project was one of many, like the Middle Road one that was included in Council's um, Active Transport um, Cycling Investment. And um, in previous days, the Active Transport Group would have gone through and done a bit of a deep dive to work out what's working and what's not. Um, obviously, that from a cycling perspective, the, um, to, to coin a phrase from a former councillor, um, the sausage is easy, the sizzle is harder. Um, in terms of the infrastructure, in some ways, it's the easy piece. It's actually getting behaviours and use um, 
and that's where those education projects and that are quite key. Yeah, just, I mean, do we do before and after um, uh, traffic counts and things like that? Because even on alternative transport, I can't remember those sort of reports coming to us. And with money becoming more difficult, it's becoming more important that we determine our progress, our successes, and how well we're spending the money. That's really the point I'm trying to get across. Uh, so there are counts done as part of that program, both traffic counts that we monitor on an ongoing basis on selected sites, just to understand general traffic trends. Um, and there's also a cycle count um, program. Um, I, I can get the team to pull together some information to make sure that's reported through. Thank you. Mayor Hazelhurst. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, thank you, team, for this report. Just a follow-up question on Napier Road Cycleway. Um, the post-construction road safety audit has closed and identified some minor safety, minor safety improvements. Uh, these will be addressed. Could you tell me what they are? Because I've had um, our residents saying that it's very dark um, and close to the cycleway, it's very dark. Did that come up in that, that order, safety order? Um, through you, um, Madam Chair, I haven't seen the detail inside that report, so I'd have to get the team to come back to provide feedback around um, what actions have been highlighted and the timeliness of um, performing those. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so we just, you know, there's not even the little cat's eyes along there. There's no lighting at all on the cycle path. Uh, and the other one was Streets for People um, and the Waka Kotahi subsidy. Uh, the school program and the expansion of um, the project of working with schools to improve traffic behaviour in the area. How many schools have we worked with and how many do we have to go? Uh, sorry, I don't have that number. I'll get that sent out from um, Ian and Larry. Um, through to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kerr. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr Thu, can you explain to us regarding the change to speed limits? We've all sat through the speed limit bylaw um, changes and it's been... Um, a very big process as we listen to our community, um, both sides of the changes. And I note that it's now going to move to a national register decided regionally. Can you give us a, um, a brief overview of what that will mean for us and our communities? Um, through you, Madam Chair, speed. Um, <laughs> I think that topic is quite a large one and will be worthwhile having a uh, conversation and a workshop with council to cover it at a, at a, a more a higher level. But in simple terms, um, looking for more consistent speed settings um, rather than each entity doing one road here and one road there. Um, they're also looking at changing some of the context and I know Jag and his, Mr Pano and his team are working through potential implications. Um, um, Madam Chair, could we put that down as an action point because it would be interesting to understand more fully. Certainly could. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dixon. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Napier Road crosses road roundabout. It's about a six-month con construction program. Is that correct? Uh, something like that, yes. Something like that. Maybe perhaps, yeah, the cafe there is suffering considerable reduction in patronage. <coughs> considerable. Is there any form of compensation available anywhere to assist with that? Through you, Madam Chair, our practice has not been the case. I know the team were working with them and the contractor to provide some additional signage so the patrons understood that the cafe was open and how to navigate to get in there. Um, but it has not been practice of council over many years to provide financial support to businesses in the proximity of um, works. And also, a second question, if I may, is there any other problems that have occurred that you didn't expect to start with? For example, um, old Havelock North Borough Council piping. Um, through you, Madam Chair, I'm not that close to the day-to-day -day construction. So, um, But it is absolutely a common occurrence um, working through construction program, projects where you're digging into the ground to find some assets from... Um, our predecessors from bygone days who may or may not have had records of those. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Lawson. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for a great report. I just loved reading through the whole document. Um, but I just have a question around efficient streets and the LED street light conversion. I'm just wondering, in terms of prioritising, um, you know, the substandard areas and the pole spacing, is it taken into account when prioritising safety of an area, uh, perhaps community plans, where the plan's action point might be to address safety? I'm just, is that um, part of the process of prioritisation? Uh, the team will consider those where, where they're aware of it, but they also have uh, machines that drive around and measure uh, the lighting levels, and they compare those against New Zealand standards for what's required for different types of road and pedestrian lighting. Um, and then they'll think about if there are other um, transport infrastructure where you might need to highlight it from a road safety perspective. Um, but absolutely, community plan feedback into those um, items are an important ingredient. Okay, thank you. Because I'd really like that to be a, yeah, to go up in the priority level. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Watkins. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, through you, Craig, Storford Lodge Roundabout. That seems to just have disappeared and it's in a poor state. What's the story? Uh, so that would have been resurfaced, but um, the transportation team are currently doing an intersection options analysis around what intersection does that need to be in terms of does it stay a roundabout, does it get a bigger roundabout. Um, council previously have asked questions around the um, can we fit a turn lane into Hedatonga Street, yep. um, but also actually will a roundabout cope with the traffic level as it's at now and doesn't need to go to lights or a form of um, more formal traffic control. So um, Mr Gonigan is working through those options currently um, and there are interrelationships depending on what either ever happens or doesn't happen with the northeastern connector because if the northeastern connector doesn't go in, a Mahu Road will likely need to have some changes in configuration as well. So um, I can get an update from Bruce to be, um, give a heads up to Council in the next report. Yeah, and if I can just add through you, Chair, I mean, um, good that we're doing those um, uh, detailed investigations around the options, particularly in the context of you know, we are aware that um, you know, after a number of years there's going to be some significant development on the old um, Caltech site. We are working with that uh, new, new owner and part of um, this, if we ever want to um, pursue options like a left-hand turn onto Hitatanga, um Street, um, then getting all of this um, sorted before we see any significant new um, you know, development is, is pretty critical. Anything along? Probably, um, as you're aware, um, through you, Madam Chair, the big headline for rural living in the last quarter was um, a little bit of rain, um, which caused us for transportation. Currently, um, Mr Jackson's assessment and driving around with Whakakotahi in terms of our co-funding, we're looking at around uh, 1.4 million, um, largely in our rural area. Um, financially, um, the um, Rural Community Board with their Rural Flood Reserve um, is able to cope with that. Obviously, it does take a fair amount of money out of that reserve. Um, and compared to our neighbours, um, we've got off um, quite lightly. Um, but however, there are months of work to fix some of the damage, and particularly around road drop-offs. Um, and the transportation team will give a far deeper briefing through to the Rural Community Board at their next meeting. The longest one, which is mentioned in the report in terms of getting um, service back to our community, is the, is the trees that have collapsed on um, Darkie Spur. Um, it's a great one when we do the next election. We'll see if it's dry enough to take a bus ride down there because it's a great road. No. No. Um, no. But that's where we've had an unmanaged forestry block uh, that has pretty much collapsed in a slip all the way down, and we've got pickup sticks all the way through. So. Um, it goes to the risks of land use, um, forestry blocks going in that are unmanaged and um, all just having pine all at the same age, it tends to die at the same age and collapse at the same age. So there are some land planning things to work through from a community board point of view. Um, but the team did very well, our contractors across the transport end, to be fair, in the Three Waters, 
in the parks area responded extremely efficiently for us. Um, it was a bit tight in the three water space as we had the high intensity, but we managed to get through without um, having to unload anything onto the environment and it didn't take too long for the transportation team to turn most of the network on, so just a big thanks to all our suppliers and team who helped with that. Thank you. Councillor Kerr. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and Mr Thu. Uh, from the rural community, a big shout out and public acknowledgement of our staff and the contractors and subcontractors who, it was incredible, the amount of water that came through and then seeing the roads open by the end of the day, uh, bar a few. Um, I guess my question is around communications. Um, as, as events like this will happen more often, um, how are we going to continue to inform the community about how to report, where to get the most, um, as I've heard said, the one single point of truth, and also to explain to our community about our limitations with funding given Waka Kotahi's um, funding decisions. So just wanting to know if there's any um, space for that information to go out to our rural community and probably actually the greater community. Through you, Madam Chair, um, a, a lot of this is rinse and repeat and keep repeating the messaging. Um, please call the 871 5000, um, logging things through there. Um, on our website from traffic closures, we have on our website a live view of where there are restrictions in road closures. Um, we need to keep repeating that. Um, in the rural community, I think the rural newsletter is an important ingredient that the rural community board take a lead on. Um, and then each event we take a lessons learned post event to say are there some things that we could do a little bit better and different and because every event has a little peculiarity that highlights something that you perhaps haven't thought about um, to work on. Um, and you're right, um, climate change and all the things coming out of these things are only going to get more and people being aware of, particularly in some of these locations when their connections are more tenuous um, we have a couple of areas of our network where we have low-level bridges and when someone moves into that area and if they're not aware that they, they have a low-level bridge, um, there is no access when the river's up with a low-level bridge. Um, just raised a, a question, probably can't answer it now, but um, for properties that are beyond a low-level bridge on a single access road, is there anything put on the LIM report? And if not, can we please take that as a let's think about whether we should, as in a warning to the purchaser, but not for now. Mm. Um, through you, Chair, I just wondered, um, Craig, if you could advise us when the roundabout, the new roundabout, it's not so new now, at Iron Gate, will be completed. So my understanding, uh, so the completion for, oh, through you Madam Chair, the completion is the planting in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so in the last week or so the team have weed sprayed out the middle and the plants are due to arrive this week or next. Um, I don't have an actual date but I'll get um, thank you. Um, no, the fine. team just to flick a message through. Great, thank you. Oh, thank you. Just a question around ageing roads, and you mentioned there Tomato Peak Road, and you're coming back to Council with further discussions. What's the likely time frame? Because I know the Tomato Peak Trust Board are really interested. Through you, Madam Chair. So two topics in there, um, and you're right, Tomato Peak Road fits with both. Um, if there's enough space, we're a bit tight for time at the Capital Workshop now because the bus trips squeezed it down. But now that we've moved the operations workshop, we might have the ability to create some time for the Capital Workshop. Um, Marius was going to present to Council some of the challenges for the Tomato Peak Road and the proposal and, and, and options to how to progress it. Um, and at that we'll be able to talk through because Tomato Peak Road has multiple stages in Council's Capital Plan. Yeah, yeah. Um, in short, to build the full scope that's um, given direction of in terms of the corridor plan, in terms of footpaths and everything, um, in this current environment is very expensive and it's important that Council has an opportunity to consider that to carry on on that approach or if there's some alternatives that the team have been working up on. In terms of ageing roads, that goes to our issue that 
our level of funding, which you're all aware of that we work through the LTP, our level of funding isn't enough to hit the optimum renewal rate. So we're replacing our surfacing at the right time, we're replacing our pavements at the right time. Um, that means that our risk of pavement failures and faults and additional complaints will continue to increase until we have the appropriate funds to actually get back on top of, a, of an annualised renewal rate. Like you, I'm just conscious of the continued increase in traffic going right to the top and the danger of that particular road. Thank the, you. Yeah, and the first section is that piece just past, just at the end of the houses and where, where the road itself is, um, the pavement's knackered, technical term there. <laughs> This doesn't need to be about me, trust me. <laughs> um, so uh, there's a lot of detail in this report um, through the section, particularly around Three Waters. Um, Ms. Hanson has just vacated the room, yet to go to another meeting. Um, but he's obviously, um, Graham, the team, um, Steve and Herman are progressing through with the big um, water treatment upgrades. Um, within the, in the small communities, there are a number of um, commissioning phases kicking into gear, um, and the construction of Fokker 2 is um, head, heading, heading well. So the small community um, supplies is well entrained. Um, supply line, so we talked earlier at the start of the meeting around price increases, but... Um, the challenge of delivering is also supply chains, and Councillor Nixon, I think you mentioned around um, importing and the ports out of Shanghai. Um, right at this moment, we have lithium batteries that we need for Frimley sitting at the port in Shanghai that we can't get off the port. There was some boat space that we thought we could jump on not recently, but there wasn't enough containers to put the batteries in, and you're not allowed to fly lithium batteries because they have a, a, an explosive element to them. So supply lines remain a challenge no matter how much pre-work. So some of the stuff we've ordered and bought and paid for 12 months ahead of time. So we're doing our best to try and manage those and it's just about staying um, agile to the realities that we can't control. Um, Waiataha, you would have seen um, those of you who were around last week, a bit of action on the site next to us. We had cranes lifting the lid up, which you can just see in the top picture. Uh, and now they will start jacking up and layer, adding in layer after layer. And then there was a convoy of concrete trucks in the morning uh, late last week um, with the concrete um, foundations poured for the second reservoir. I can and channel Mr. Mr. Hanson and say he had a superb week last week with uh, the cranes jacking up the, uh, the tank, the foundation pour, and all of his uh, has no consents outstanding for anything anymore. The building consents have been issued for the Water Education Centre, the consent exemptions for um, what we're doing at Fokker 2, and, um, you know, and pleasingly, we're largely inside, um, you know, in, inside the Waiaroha um, site now. So notwithstanding some of the challenges with supply chains, things are progressing uh, really, really well, and I think, as you all know, um, you know, Graham's KPI is to uh, deliver Waiaroha um, by in the Matariki window in 2023, and that will be the conclusion of a $82 million water improvement program that will be nearly seven years um, since the Havelock North uh, water contamination. So, yeah, we're in the, we're well and truly notwithstanding, uh, you know, some of the challenges in the final. Um, the final stretch now around what has been the council's number one priority since 2018. So really pleasing progress on three waters. Um, so, so just building through on the report, just a couple of the other headlines and just points to take away is um, in there you have your report around our drinking water compliance. Um, obviously in that last quarter, um, Ministry of Health issued their final drinking water assessment, um, which gained some national media. Um, and in there, um, we had a little piece in the media um, where um, an issue was raised, because as you're all aware, um, the main Hastings urban supply and a couple of our rural ones, um, until all the treatment works is finished, we fail under the current standards, the protozoal requirement. Um, as we've talked about, although it was many years ago, um, we've done extensive risk assessments 
extensive testing to understand the scale of that risk. Um, and we continuously monitor to make sure that risk stays at a very, very low level. Um, saying that, once the treatment plants all go in um, with the additional of UV treatment, that will eliminate that non-compliance to the current standards. Um, on standards, um, this council joined up with our regional partners, submitted through to Tamata Arawai on their proposed standards, their proposed quality assurance guidelines. Um, but also we um, submitted as a region on their proposal for private supplies and um, um, acceptable solutions um, to give feedback from the region. Um, and we'll see where that comes. And we submitted to MFE on the proposed national environmental standards for drinking water, um, giving them some things to think about around their um, direction of travel. We're yet to hear back on what the feedback processes for those are. Um, you'll also note in the report we've flagged that um, HBRC have let us know that from our urban global stormwater consent, we, are non we will be non-compliant. Um, there was a note that would have gone out from the lead team, heads up to you, but it's also included in this report. Um, largely around um, the management, um, or particularly around the Ruahapia, where we had a couple of events in the last year. Um, they're happy with the teams, my understanding, are they're happy with the team's response to the events, but they're concerned we haven't yet to take all reasonable practical steps. Now, we're having conversations with their staff to just fully understand that. Um, there are some complicated um, inter interactions, and the recent one that played out, um, which is not in this quarter, that was an event last week, um, highlights where the party who we believe discharged um, some water warmer than it should be is consented by HBRC, but they use the conveyance of our pipe. So it, there's some of the stuff in this space that just needs to make simpler and easier and actually get to the base of where the pollution or issues are coming from. Um, can I just ask that once that um, investigation has been completed, that goes back through risk and assurance? Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, I can also advise, after having some vacancies in the stormwater space, that we have now managed to appoint a stormwater officer who will be managing and chasing those elements up more directly, and we have a new stormwater asset manager who will start at the end of the month, so that helps fix some vacancies around in the space. On the positive side in stormwater is um, Mr Cave is progressing well with the multi-barrier work out at Lowe's Pit, which is the model we'll be rolling through into the Roa Hapia catchment where this issue, there's some of these issues um, and wider. So we have the right ingredients, it's just um, getting through to those. Councillor Watkins. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Craig, you mentioned in the report about Frimley number four bore progressing there. Um, last week when I was there, the engineers said they'd gone down to 79 metres and were very pleased with what they'd found. So I, I don't know whether they're going further, but um, that was where they were at at that stage. Um, you've probably had a more direct conversation than I have personally, but it's at 70 to 80 metres where most of the water we're pulling out of um, Frimley is at, so that sounds yeah. correct. Mia yeah, Hazelhurst. Um, kia ora. Uh, I just wonder about, um, it's just so exciting to see all of the water stuff happening and I've been so excited walking up to the Mayor's office and seeing all of the waiaraha and the major storage being um, created and, and it's, it's just so exciting. Um, but my question is around the Water New Zealand National Performance Review and um, and... Uh, to read recently that 17% of our drinking water pipelines are in poor condition and 9% of wastewater networks in poor condition. Um, we, you know, I mean, that's compared to other councils in New Zealand, that is very low, but in terms of us making sure that all of our pipes are in good condition, can you just advise us when and when those are in the long-term plan to replace or change? Um, yes, the National Performance Review, I think we're about 13% in the drinking water, 9% in wastewater in those condition assessments. Um, what I think might be a really useful thing to do, and we went to do it a, a year or two ago, but there was so much else on that um, we didn't do it, was actually we'd take council through a workshop, an ops workshop, 
where we can actually take you through the wider NPR report because it is really useful in terms of benchmarking us against others. Um, and sometimes there is an apple and orange, so sometimes someone looks poor and they're fine, and sometimes someone looks great and they're not. Um, but I think that would be a really useful, and then we can play that in context with the current um, asset planning and the renewal rate. Because um, it's been a long time since the wider council's done a deeper dive because the LTPs, we've been on the journey. Um, and um, some of the newer councillors may not be fully aware of the approach, particularly, say, in wastewater on low-volume streets, we were running a, a run-to-failure risk model, which we'll see a proportion of um, poor and very poor just by nature of that's your investment approach, and similar for um, lower risk, um, different elements. So um, I think if we pull together a workshop just to talk through that, we can, I can send you a link, because we actually also commissioned a direct report just for us, um, which may be useful information for the wider council to have an appreciation. Because you're right, we've done a lot of great stuff and we're on a lot of journey, but like every large asset holding, it is um, some bits are in as new condition and some bits are coming close to um, replacement. And um, many of you who are around when my predecessor was around used to talk about if you've got no faults, you've overinvested as well. So there is a balance around making sure there's stuff coming and going. So I'm happy to organise... Uh, maybe a one hour to one and a half hour briefing just to help um, share those stories. So you're all well informed in that space. Well, I think it's absolutely crucial actually, Craig, because you know we need to fully understand the condition of our assets and, and what investment is needed. And you know, I know that 100% isn't is probably um, you know, able to, to be achieved, but uh, we need to fully understand the importance of of this, we've been caught out, you know, in the past. And um, when we, when the uh, national performance review is undertaken, I will, um, could we please note, Chair, that we would like that included in in these agendas. Now, this significant piece of work that the rest of the country is seeing, and our governance table needs to understand what this looks like. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barber. I support um, um, your worship school little uh, that national survey I mean the media pick up on the on the kind of the um, the highlights of the the report and you know it can be taken out of context but I think the, the councillors need to really understand the context uh, that those figures have come out with Um so yeah, no, I, I think a, a workshop, um, Craig, would be good, um, so that we all understand what the numbers mean. Because if you're reading it on face value, it looks like we 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 when we're not there, even though we've invested so much money in in uh, upgrading our infrastructure. So, uh, and I, I know I'll talk to you, and, and it's not actually the case. I mean, we, we, we well, we it is the case, but we're not too far out from getting where we need to be. So uh, yeah, a workshop would be a good idea. Happy to organise because there's also elements that the NPR doesn't monitor that governance needs to be aware of. So probably the other last big one to note, our, 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 our Tangata Whenua Joint Wastewater Committee will have a large programme for the next 18 months um, because we'll be going through the consent review. And um, a key part of that consent is um, working with the Tangata Whenua members in particular around setting the scope of this and the scale of that review. Um, to that end, I'm meeting with the chair um, to set up quite frequent meetings just to make sure we've got a clear program of works um, to set the terms of reference, um, which will go into our reconsenting process. Um, we've got a couple of years, but time disappears really, really fast. But it's also important we get that in place prior to any um, reform agenda. So uh, our area and our council has um, a strong footprint all over that. Excellent. Chair, just to, uh, before you jump into that, um, <coughs> just on that one, uh, Craig, uh, the, the Manafenua Joint uh, Wastewater Committee, is that is that for the reconsenting of the of the current um, Wastewater plant, or is that yeah? So it's is that what um, that cope up is about? Yeah, through you, Madam Chair. It, it, absolutely, it's for the East Clive wastewater treatment plant. 
So we have a 35-year consent, but it has nine-year reviews. Yep. And so it's working through with that committee, that nine-year review process. Okay. You, you know, in terms of the um, the Cape Coast, uh, uh, you know, work around um, climate change and all that, um, how, how does that impact? I'm just thinking about where the where the uh, the plant is located. Is that all part of the review, or is that something something different? Through you, Madam Chair, it, it, it's a context. It's probably not a burning context just yet, um, but it's one that we need to have consideration for, particularly if we're looking at further investment is where's the right place for that to be. Um, further into mm. time, that plant becomes more potentially more and more precarious if you work through sea level rise, ground go going down. Um, yeah, so that's part of that future planning work that council's doing, which will go into spatial planning thinking as well. So what are the future states? Where do we need to invest? And how will we treat wastewater? Um, not just the next three or nine years, but what's the setting up past that? Mm. Okay. Fiona. So, um, through you, Madam Chair, so a, a quick over on Hastings Alive as a strategic priority area um, for the quarter end of March, so there was you know, multiple activations um, in the city centre, uh, there was the peace pose with giant flamingos and we had, we had giant cactus, octopoda, um, not in this um, quarter, but not long after it, the poppy, poppy project in for the, for the Anzac commemoration as well, um, the Hastings City Business Association had their bumper boats, so you know, lots, of, lots of activations um, within the Hastings City Centre. Um, those outdoor hospitality areas around um, Westermans, Breakers, John's Bakery, Madeline's, they're all complete. Um, and obviously, as you, you'll know, the, the streetscape upgrade um, along Kiritonga Street East 300 block outside the municipal building um, is, is well underway um, and aligning its completion with the opening. Uh, so we are through, through the, the quarter ending March. You know, we, we are in that final stages of, of fit out, and most a lot of you had a bit of a walk around uh, a month ago. Um, and we are looking um, at that August opening or celebration weekend on the 5th and 8th of August. Uh, that's been locked in, and and looking at a, a opening of the businesses and tenancies from the week commencing July the 4th. Um, so they'll a bit of a staggered approach, um, probably two or three of them will open um, on the Monday, uh, the restaurants will open on the Wednesday and, and will flow in um, from there on. So um, that's well, all just going to plan. On, on, Muni, uh, on the municipal through you, Chair, having just seen both um, Darren and Eddie just before the meeting, um, they were delighted that they've passed all the final inspections and passed all the water pressure tests, so we yes. went through all of the uh, consenting um, processes, so just to get more more milestones. Thank you. Councillor Shalom. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, and I'd like to just take a minute to acknowledge the huge amount of work that's actually been going on as part of our revitalisation plan in the CBD, despite the um, constraints and challenges that COVID-19 have put upon us. Um, so, so huge kudos to the team for keeping that rolling. Um, a question that sprung to mind while I've been in this meeting, so I apologise, I haven't forwarded it in advance is around our activation plan that we've got summarised within this, this report. And I'm really conscious of the decision that Council made last week to um, invest in the COVID recovery plan, which is fantastic, but I understand that comes at a, at a cost to the activation plan. Is that correct? Yes, that is a consequence. So I'm, I'm keen to understand it doesn't have to be answered here today, so it could just be an action to take away. Um, I'm keen to understand whether or not uh, there is an ability or a mechanism for council to potentially apply to the vibrancy fund if something really significant comes up that, that um, could bring that lovely activation into the CBD uh, above and beyond what we've got planned for the COVID-19 recovery plan. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, can I just note as well, um, because it is in this report, we are New Zealand's most beautiful small city. I just want to emphasise that again and how fantastic it is and how wonderful Hastings is. Thank you. Councillor Corbyn. Thank you, Chair. Um, a question on the Museum of Storage and Research. In the paper, I notice work is progressing on developing the cultural narrative that will support the external design. 
Is that reference to the Tiaranga design principles? Um, yes, it is, and, and, and broader than that as well. So it's a conversation that we've, um, Dr. James Graham and Charles Robertini have supported us with um, and connected them with the right um, members of our community. And I think we'll be, I think there's a meeting scheduled in a week's time with the joint working group to take them through that in more detail as, as to where that's been had. But yeah, absolutely. And, and I've got, well, it's really a comment on the Tiaranga design principles. I went to look for them on the council website so I could direct um, someone to them. And they're buried in the residential intensification guide, uh, which is, isn't, it's not an appropriate place for a building such as this or any other community building which is not residential. And I'm just wondering at what point we'll be featuring it prominently on the website. Um, Thank you for the feedback, and yes, we will um, action that and give it, a, give it more prominence if that's um, the, the case. Next one. So, um, for the last three, two <laughs> <laughs> strategic priority areas, um, Rebecca will take us through those. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, Kia ora, Councillors. Um, pathways for our people. Uh, COVID-19 has had impacts on our planned community events in the last quarter. Um, unfortunately, it has um, left us unable to take our Mahi for Youth uh, caravan out to some of our more rural locations. Um, so we've now um, put that to this next quarter. Um, we've had a, a noticeable reduction of walk-ins into our Mahi for Youth pop-up as well. Um, but we are still supporting our rangatahi online and through phone calls, etc. Um, we were able to hold some information um, sessions to help uh, the hort industry get some, um, hopefully, some more people into their workforce. Uh, we held three sessions in Hastings CBD, Flaxmere and Camberley. Um, and that was to link people with employers. So we worked with MSD, New Zealand Apple, Apples and Pears and Connected to do that. Um, in addition, this quarter we've appointed our youth council. We had um, 19 applicants and 16 orangutahi were appointed. They range from 15 to 20 years of age, 10 new appointees and six returning appointees also. Um, they now have a chair and their first meeting in March was really to set their priorities for the year ahead and um, our youth strategy, uh, the draft is almost finished. Um, we're hoping to get that out to our Great Community Subcommittee this quarter. Um, it captures over a 1,000 youth voices, so we had really good input through um, multiple um, questionnaires and sessions to get, to get all those voices in, so you'll see that soon also. <coughs> so any, any happy to take questions, Madam Chair? Councillor Shalom. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for the information that you've included in this comprehensive report. I see under um, sort of the youth strategy, there was 92% approval um, for a youth facility. So a real need for a youth facility was emphasised as part of that survey with our young people. And I'm just really keen to understand what is the process from here? So we've had this feedback come in from our, our rangatahi and our young people. What, what do we do from here? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, so what we, we, we're obviously going to put that forward as a recommendation in our youth strategy. So if you, as a council, um, endorse that youth strategy, then we'll need to put forward a plan as to how it will be financed or, or how it could be incorporated in other projects. And, and one might be, for example, you know, with our whole library redevelopment, that might be an opportunity to look at it there. But basically it will come through the youth strategy for an endorsement from council. Wonderful, thank you. And I'd just like to acknowledge as well uh, the fantastic succession planning that's been happening within the Youth Council. It's wonderful to see six rangatahi who have experience being on the Youth Council and ten who are brand new and eager to learn and the pairing up that's going there. So I'd just like to acknowledge the staff that were involved in that. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Watkins. Oh, thank you, Chair. Just in relation to the Youth Council, um, it was great last Friday afternoon to see six members of the Youth Council um, turn up at the Flaxmere Community Centre for a three and a half hour Zoom session observing the Global Youth Conference which was hosted by one of our friendships at Eden China. 
So they did extremely well to last the distance, and uh, it was great to see them participating in that. So. Excellent. Mayor Hazelhurst. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Rebecca, I just wonder uh, on the aquatics, uh, the work, uh, uh, I, I see that we have undertaken a survey, uh, which is great. It's going to feed back into um, different opportunities. But uh, have we undertaken this aquatic strategy to look at our overall strategy, how the new regional aquatic um, centre is going to feed into... Uh, I mean, we've got Learn to Swim in Clive. We've got about 6,000 people learning to swim. Have we had a wider strategic vision on how we're going to um, operate uh, collectively with a new regional pool in Hastings? Yes, through you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, it, it's certainly a work in progress. Um, uh, Mr. Allen and I were able to go through the new pool uh, the week before last, and we had um, discussions with those involved in that. Um, they have offered, actually, to provide us more information. We're just waiting to hear on the date for that. Uh, what we're hoping is that, that, that their operating model will then um, really give us the information we need to then think about how we will um, operate our pools going forward. And there's certainly lots of, of change happening. And at the moment, we really need to understand what their priorities are going forward so that we can understand what our place in the community will be. Um, in addition to that, we are working with um, Sport Hawks Bay uh, to do a regional uh, sports field and facilities review. And so the aquatics will be part of that also. Councillor Lawson. Thank you, Chair. Um, not really a question, just a, a couple of comments. Um, really looking forward to our next Great Communities subcommittee because a lot of these strategies, reviews mentioned in this paper will be covered off at that next meeting. Um, but also just want to acknowledge the challenges that, you know, that you've had to face with regard to the COVID and, and how well the team has managed that. Um, and those, I can't help but mention the employer connector update. I mean, those couple of stories about Wahine who have done so well. And I mean, that's what's so great to see that in this report. And um, that's what it's all about. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, just moving on to um, enhancing where we live. Um, I mean, as you're well aware, COVID-19 continued to impact our event sector, including Toy Toy and our art gallery. Um, when we moved to Red on the 23rd of January, most of our events at Toy Toy in both February and March were either, either cancelled or postponed. What's that, what that has meant is that we will be very busy in the first quarter of next year. Um, most of our events have a sort of 10-week lead-in time, so um, that's why they go on um, into the next financial year. Um, our libraries and community centres updated offerings within COVID-19 settings. Um, it was difficult for small teams, certainly out at some of our community centres where the teams are very small anyway, so obviously when you lose staff it, it is quite difficult. Um, but the teams did all sorts of things to help lots go ahead anyway. Our art gallery team had art to go packs, which literally parents could pick up contactless and take off for their children. They're really good, by the way. I have used them. Um, we had floor talks that had to be cancelled and um, they were able to be done online. Um, obviously, the libraries had lots of programs, pick and mix as, as well. And even our Nourish for Nil, we, we packaged all the food up and, again, had a contactless service, so all that was able to go ahead um, nearly um, as usual. Uh, the new Hastings Sports Centre mural was completed in January. Um, the design was informed by community workshop discussions. So um, what it does is it showcases diversity through the lens of various ethnic communities. We've had, had some great feedback in regards to that. Um, in regards to Splash Planet, um, obviously there's lots of maintenance and improvements undertaken, um, condition reports for buildings, but also the Lazy River where um, cracks had started to um, show. Um, flying fox, carpet, painting, um, and uh, the wrapping of the slide tower, which is complete now. Um, 
we've got new basketball hoops at Flexmere Park and we've got a new playground St, uh, St Albans Street that's being completed as well and you'll see a list of, of things in that area that's being completed this quarter. Um, and we've also joined the Welcoming Communities Programme, which has attracted funding of $50,000 a year for the next three years. And that will allow us to employ a um, wel Welcoming Communities Coordinator. So that person will be responsible for, for welcoming people into the Hastings District, whether they be from New Zealand or from overseas, or RSE workers. Um, their job will be making sure that they are welcomed into our Hastings community. And we'll work out, obviously, how exactly that occurs when they come on board. Um, as well, we've had lots of staff supporting Taifenua um, to deliver their welfare packages out to our community. Happy to take any questions. And just on the last point, through you, Chair, can I just acknowledge the fantastic job that Te Taifenua or Hiratanga did as the um, locality um, hub for the welfare response. I think by virtue of the fact that Hastings District is just so large, um, but the number of whānau that were supported through that period, um, and, and it was just, uh, I mean, again, really proud of the role that um, the Council played as a partner in terms of supporting that, but um, we, we, we were, um, can't speak highly enough of um, Mike, um, and Waylon, and, and the team for um, just the awesome way that you led uh, you know, the, the welfare response to our um, community through um, Om Om Omicron. Do you want to say anything about that? No, thank you, Madam. I really just wanted to recognise the, the input that, uh, the part that Hastings City Council, Hastings District Council, alongside others in our community, really got behind. Um, supporting our community, our, our, our wider community. So there was, um, I think we delivered um, well out there in health packs, so over 20,000 people, some 4,500 uh, households. Without the community coming together, we would not have been able to achieve that. So I think we should celebrate ourselves, not just the Taifun or Hira Tonga. Kia ora Thank you. That was an extraordinary effort. Amazing. Are there any... Uh, questions about the report, or can I ask for a mover or seconder for the recommendation? Oh, sorry, Councillor Barber has a question. Yeah, just uh, don't talk all those mihi to the Taifenua and, and those groups that uh, supported that, but just getting to the uh, basketball hoop or the backboards at, uh, at Flaxmere, what are they made out of? They're made out of steel. <laughs> <laughs> um, through you, Madam Chair. Um, Serious question, though. What are what are the backboards made out of? I mean, they've, they've smashed a, a number of the glass ones, eh? Yes. So, so their initial um, glass ones, after a couple of goes, um, the team are now looking at an alternative, um, more robust, but not necessarily to the same standard, um, but still functional um, material that can survive those unfortunate conditions. Thank you, Councillor Shulman. I just say that um, I just say that in 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 our Waimarama Marae, we've we've had a basketball hoop there for uh gee, our oldest boy's twenty four. It must be like 10, 12 years, and that gets a whole lot of abuse. You know, good abuse in terms of playing on on the hoop, um, but a lot of kids use it. Fun, no, come to the Marae Tangies, whatever. But the backboards are made out of, um, you know, they're a, they're a metal backboard. And, and so we've never had any problems with, um, you know, breaking or, or uh, uh, vandalism or anything like that. So, you know, just uh, a, a, um, a thought really around how, how, how to stop that problem. See you, Madam Chair, that Waimarama don't have the robust... Greek god built type athlete. We haven't flexed me. Oh, Canada, Canada, Canada. 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 <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> Councillor Shalom. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, uh, on page 77, where it talks about customer service, I see that our electronic communications are up by 12%. Um, and I'm just wondering. Uh, and again, I'm sorry, this is a question that's come to me in the meeting, so I haven't pre forwarded it. I'm just wondering how we measure satisfaction and response times to those electronic communications. 
and, and whether or not we can have some reporting around that as well. Uh, you can have some reporting on that. I'll, I'll, mm. <laughs> there's something we'll have to look into. Um, okay. we'll, is, we'll take that as yeah. an action. Thank you. And then one more action, if that's all right. Um, uh, where's my notes? Sorry, one moment. Um, I've, I've had a few um, constituent calls re recently that Brett Chapman's been very helpful with in terms of um, there's been subsidences in um, uh, council uh, drainage areas and whatnot, which is um, which are often walkways. And, and so I've been talking with Brett, and I was wondering if at, a, at the next Ops and Monitoring meeting, if we could possibly have some information around stability around the district and those types of areas. I'm, I'm more than happy to have a chat offline just to give more information and be a bit clearer. Um, <laughs> I can see, yes, yep, thank you. Um, and then the final thing, I just want to acknowledge on page 85 it talks about cyber security and how Council has had three independent cyber security providers test our systems and that Council has come out above average and I'd just like to acknowledge that and say that's fantastic and may we continue to strive that way. And while that's good, I have been made aware that a third of the people sitting around this table have yet to complete their fishing professional development. Oh, no. So could we please make that a high priority because that, that is a flaw in our system. Thank you, Mayor Hazelhurst. Oh, uh, thank you, Chair, through you, Chair. Um, I've just asked two of my council colleagues and um, they can't help me, but um, Laurie Cook Reserve Playground, could you tell us where that is? Yes. By the regional sports park on the Lyndhurst development. Lyndhurst development, and thank you. Laurie was asking me the other day, what's the progress report? Oh, okay, well, that's good. We know that that's in good progress. And the other question is around the kiosk in Cornwall Park. Um, so while we're looking at the additions to the playground in Cornwall Park, um, is, that, is that all part of the kiosk? Or is that when it says uh, playground additions contracts have been let for equipment and surfacing? and civil works be included as part of the T kiosk contract. Hoping to start on the playground September, October. So where are we at with the kiosk? I, I can just double check with the team, but my understanding that's all incorporated into that. It's um, all part time. of that So there's for contractors at this point. Okay, thank you. And I just want to make a comment um, to finish. Um, I went to the C uh, Hastings Cemetery on Mother's Day, and, and I just was... I mean, I can't wait till the new financial year when we put the parking in and 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 separate off uh, places of rest um, from parking and so forth. But can I just thank the team um, and the amazing work at the Hastings Cemetery? Uh, there, there were many, many people there. Um, beautiful, beautiful toilets, and it was just a lovely place. And so, you know, the enhancement that we'll do after the first of July will just add to it, but can can I just thank everybody that's involved in caring for the, our Hastings Cemetery. I'm very proud of it. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have a recommendation to um, receive that report. Could I have a move and second to thank you, Councillor Lawson. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. I'm going to put that recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Thank you, Carrie. Now, can I just draw your attention to one final extra item that you've been alluded to, and it is to do with the local government, um, the local government conference, and the fact that there are two remits that have been suggested to us by two other councils, and we have a recommendation which asks us to um, receive the report, which you have had as an extra and that this committee resolves to deal with this matter as an urgent agenda item, and that for any remit seeking council support, consultation be undertaken with all councillors and mayor and the mayor. Um, and you had the opportunity on the hub to read those two, um, those two potential remits. One was from Gisborne Council, which was to do with the whole topic of gambling, and the other one was from the New Plymouth District Council, and it was to do with an independent review into Waka Kotahi uh, and the way in which they fund transport investments. And I know I have heard around this table a lot of support for potentially for both of those remits. So can I have a, um, a mover and seconder 
to accept those three recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Nixon, and thank you, Councillor Kerr. Can I ask a question, please? Yes, you may. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. In the recommendations, it says um, consultation will be undertaken with all councillors. How would you like us to feed our thoughts back? Um, is there somebody within the staff that we send this to? Do we send it to the Mayor's office? Do we send it to you? Because I, too, would like to, um, in writing, support both of these remits. Um, I'm just thinking to myself, uh, given that they are their remits, so there isn't uh, really the opportunity for us to tinker with the remits as written. I agree. So we actually, all we need to do is actually support it or not support it. Mm -hmm. Do people feel sufficiently um, knowledgeable about the content of those two remits if we actually had a bit of a straw poll today to see whether it's generally supported? What are your thoughts, Mayor Hazelhurst? Oh, I think that, that's a good approach, Madam yeah. Chair. I think, um, and I think if the, anyone's got anything that they'd like to add, like the Deputy Mayor, then just email my office yeah. um, and we can take that to the conference. Okay, so the, the remit relating to <coughs> um, the funding of Waka Kotahi um, and the way in which they fund new developments and maintenance programs. I'm just going to assume you've had a chance to read that. So could I have a show of hands as to how many councillors support that remit? Thank you. Well, I think that's carried, really. Um, we could certainly have a debate about some of that. Yep. Yeah, we could. Okay. Well, let's do that. <laughs> And then while you're working on the, on the wording of that one, let's have a look at the other one, the um, Gisborne one, which was relating to gambling and what they were asking for was an amendment to the Gambling Act and the Racing Industry Act to give councils broader scope <coughs> um, for their policies under these acts, including the ability to apply controls and restrictions on existing venues, um, just looking at the whole thing about gambling harm. Now, is there, could I have a show of hands as to whether councillors support that as well? So just a question, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, yeah, sure. Beforehand, it mentions in there one that Hastings District Council have been leading a group of councils lobbying the government to regulate online gambling and minimise problem gambling. What actions are we currently taking in that process because we've been mentioned? Well, I think um, one of the things, well, not so much online gambling, but the fact that we had the sinking lid for our pokies yeah. um, it attracted some um, favourable response around the country. Th thank you for that, Chair. I'm more concentrating on the dangerous online. one. It's online gambling is the yes, exactly. most dangerous of all, all of them. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah, um, Councillor Kerr, you it appears then that we've got some favourable response for something that we haven't done. Yeah, <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> okay, so let's just see that show of hands for people who approve yeah. that Gisborne oh, remit. I'll oh, throw you, Chair. Oh, we've got um, some questions. Could we just ask the officers if anything has yeah, sure. been done that um, that council may not have been we might, written? May not be aware of? Mr O'Shaughnessy? Not here. Not here. Yeah. Through you, Chair. I understand that at our last gambling um, meeting, we did specifically ask for um, some action to be taken around that in terms of lobbying government. I wonder if um, we could get an update on that, um, maybe at the next stops and monitoring meeting, or okay. if we can't get that today. Mm. Or great communities, yeah. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Nixon, did you have something to say? All I was going to say is this is the first stage of quite a complex process to get a remit through. So um, 
so I can support it because it's going to go through a lot more examination after this. And I decided, let's just get behind it at this point and, and try and get some conversation and maybe even some action. Yeah. So I, th I think now, if I can just have that show of hands for people who support that remit. Yes, I've noted you, Councillor Barber. Yeah, that's a, a clear majority as well. Thank you. And we're just working on some rewording of the recommendations. Chair, can I just clarify what Councillor Nixon said about the remit process? Um, the way it works, from my knowledge, is that it doesn't go through a zone meeting. It needs the support of five councils. And if it gets the support of five councils, then whether it goes any further is considered by the National Executive of Local Government New Zealand. And at that stage, if they don't consider it important to be one of their top five, it stops. I think that's correct. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now, because we're working in quite a time constraint, which is why this item came to this meeting, which, strictly speaking, it doesn't normally have part of, what we're suggesting, if you just have a look at the recommendations, if we leave um, recommendation A as it is, B as it is, and in C, if we just delete, as you can see up there, um, consultation to be undertaken with all councillors, um, because in fact we're just doing that at this moment. So if we delete that and then just move straight on to the Mayor be, de uh, be given delegated authority to determine the support and um, then she can she can move back from there and then report to the next council meeting. Are you comfortable with that? Uh, Councillor we, Nixon. We need to know if the Mayor does not accept it. Um, oh, through you, Chair, um, clearly there's a majority of yeah. support yes. of these remits, so the remits will follow due process. They will be, they'll go to the councils who have presented them to us. Um, they've likely got movers and seconders by now, and this will go, if, as Malcolm said, National Council will consider whether or not they will take them forward. So it is just a general support or not support, and we've had a clear majority here today. Thank you. I, I can accept that totally. Thank you. Councillor Kurt. Oh, thank you. And could I have a seconder for those recommendations? Thank you, Councillor Shalom. I'll put those recommendations with the amendments um, as displayed. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Thank you. And thank you for your attendance. I declare the meeting closed. Oh. Oh. Before you go, Baden, we've got two informants. <laughs>